Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Neuroelectrics webinar. Uh, welcome after the summer break. Uh, so my name is Rafael Novak, and I will be your host today. And today we'll be talking about the transcranial electrical stimulation in refractory epilepsy. I'm very happy to welcome our guest speaker. And we have today with us Dr. Daniel San Juan Horta. Hi, Daniel. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for the invitation. Good to have you here, Daniel. Allow me quickly introduce our speaker. Daniel is a neurologist, neurophysiologist, and clinical epileptologist from Mexico. He earned his medical degree at the Autonomous University of uh, Tamaulipas and relocated to Mexico City during his internship at the South Medica Foundation. Subsequently, he pursued advanced studies in adult neurology at the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery, affiliated with the um, National Autonomous University of Mexico. Then he further enhanced his expertise by completing a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology and epileptology in the Massachusetts General Hospital affiliated with the Harvard University. And his present roles encompass being a professor in clinical neurophysiology at the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Mexico. He is director of Mexico's inaugural center for the principles and practice of clinical research course and the Harvard University Affiliated Epilepsy Clinic at the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Mexico. Additionally, he holds the position of uh, national researcher at the National Council for Science and Technology in the National Research System at uh, level two in Mexico. And his areas of expertise include non-invasive neuromodulation, refractory epilepsy, intraoperative, intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring, and clinical neuroscience in general. So thank you, Daniel, for being with us today, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much for this kind introduction. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to start uh, with you this lecture. I would, uh, the title of my talk is related with the refractory uh, focal epilepsy, mainly. And this is my only conflict of interest. I received some device for research in my institute, but no other wise. I have other one. So, Epilepsy is a worldwide health problem. Uh, you can see now in this slide, the prevalence uh, adjusted by age for 1,000 idiopathic epilepsy in both sex. And you can uh, identify your country about the prevalence of epilepsy, but in, in Latin America, Africa, and some parts of Asia is a major problem because the, the disparity uh, inducing a high prevalence in developing countries, including Mexico, that is uh, highlighted in orange. So we know that the, any patient that starts with the epilepsy uh, can be a management with uh, anti seizure medication. And for us, it's very good to know that 70% of the patient with only one anti-seizure medication, get them a, a good control or seizure-free. But no all uh, get these um, wonderful results. So that is uh, the main problem that remain over decades or years uh, recently with their no uh, solutions. So that is the pharmacoresistant in epilepsy. And other problem is that you can add two or three anti-seizure medication, the possibility to get seizure-free is less of 5%. So when the patient have uh, this uh, behavior uh, using uh, anti-seizure medication, you can declare the patient with pharmacoresistant epilepsy. And other thing that is uh, very relevant in our developing countries is that only one in five get access to the comprehensive center in epilepsy, especially in Latin America. But it's similar in other countries that we don't have the resource to try to manage this refractory epilepsy. Maybe if you see only uh, the percent, you can uh, imagine how big is the problem because only for Mexico, refractory uh, epilepsy means two millions of people in, in just in one country. So you can move other countries, you will be have the same numbers. So with this data, the 
neurosurgeons community create these um, maps based in the incidence of the active epilepsy in several regions of, of, the, of the world. And now you can see how many people are candidate to the surgical uh, approach is 20 millions of people, but every year 1.4, sorry, are candidate to evaluate. So depends on the area, you can see the numbers from Europe, uh, uh, America Latina, Africa, and other uh, countries, that is, they still remain uh, a, a partial solution to this problem because it's a uh, comprehensive evaluation to get the patient, the surgery that can induce the cure. So what are the alternatives for patients that are not candidate to epilepsy surgery for many reasons that's common? Because it's bilateral, because it's multifocal, because it's syndromatic, because we don't have a very clear onset of the seizure. Well, uh, the FDA approved this device that are in the clinical, are no experimental, are usually implanted for patients with refractory epilepsy, starting with the vagal nerve stimulation, or it's a small surgery on the neck, followed by this more invasive uh, device uh, that's neurostimulators implanted directly to the cortex and then stimulate and record the activity and then create the loop or the deep brain stimulation. But unfortunately, uh, you can see in the graph that the efficacy to reduce the seizure is relatively similar. And of course, include the cause, the risks, and the accessibility, because not all these devices are available in each country. For example, uh, the neuro stimulator directly, the closed loop is only available in USA. So you can uh, use in other country. And depends on the politics of local countries, it's possible to apply one or two, but usually not all of them. So uh, for these audience that have a very uh, good background in neuromodulation, know that the, in the history, last century, was common to start uh, applying uh, non-invasive transcranial direct current stimulation using this device that was uh, abandoned back because the pharmacological treatment become more and more complex. And now we have more than 32 anti seizure medication to treat the patient with the same percent of the efficacy. So we are not so much advanced using the pharmacological treatments to try to resolve the pharmacoresistance. So mm -hmm. in general, transcranial electrical during current stimulation is a method that allow modulate the neuronal excitability depending on the polarity of stimulation. In epilepsy, it's important to know that the effect uh, that we are looking is the inhibition or hyperpolarization. So that means we are interested in the cathode pathway using different uh, areas, because you know the epilepsy can in, start in the frontal, temporal, parietal, et cetera, or multifocal. So we need to manage many sites. It's no like a specific disease. There's only one local, localization and you can apply the, the protocol, no. So at the beginning, we are uh, thinking about what is the focality of the TDC? versus the transcranial magnetical stimulation. And this is an old picture just to show you how focal can be the TMS machine versus the TDC. However, remember the epilepsy, maybe it's not so focal. We have a variety of epilepsies that can cover extensive area of the brain or be very focal. So we need both. Broad areas inducing by the standard uh, electrodes of the TDCs, for example, in uh, epileptic encephalopathies or in focal lesion, we need more precise. So we know even from this um, presurgical evaluation in patients with epilepsy that applying this uh, weak electrical current over the scalp, we can induce 
change in the neurons using these deep electrodes to lo try to localize the seizure onset during the presurgical evaluation. And the precision of the mathematical model to predict the behavior of the electrical current, the map is very good. Uh, in, the, in the other part of the slide, you can see also the effect uh, of this therapy in very deep structures. In this case, is during the um, DDS or deep brain stimulation for Parkinson disease, uh, using this very deep uh, brain uh, stimulators located in the subthalamic areas. So when the patient receives the current over the scalp, uh, these electrodes can still detect the chains in the subthalamic uh, nucleus. So it's not because the electricity can directly to get this point, it's because they are a network connection. So can move the electricity uh, across the, the brain tissue, especially uh, between the neurons. So, uh, Starting with the animal models, uh, any basic research in epilepsy know that in vitro and in vivo study uh, show that direct current stimulation and transcurrent direct current stimulation can suppress uh, epileptic for activity. And this is study uh, published in, from research from uh, Germany. You can see that only one session, uh, two million pairs, in these uh, rats can uh, induce the effect during one and a half hours. So now you can uh, transpolate to humans to see, oh, maybe one session, 20 minutes can uh, affect uh, during one and a half hour. So because the threshold is uh, increased, so that means that is hyperpolarization or inhibition. Uh, using uh, only cathodal in this uh, graph. So uh, there are other models for acute uh, models in epilepsy using the PTC, that is a very common uh, pro-convulsive uh, medication in these animal models. And also you can get the benefits uh, to see, oh, after the second uh, try of the PTC, it's possible to increase the latency uh, to develop the second seizures or the duration or can improve the efficacy of other uh, benzodiazepine drug, for example. So uh, in these animal models, we can see the sham, the cathodal 0.1 milliampere or 1 milliampere. And of course, it's dose dependent. So if you increase to the standard one milliampere, you can get better results comparing with the sham, but it still is a difference uh, with the sham. <clears throat> and also it's possible to analyze like in humans, the cortical excitability using the transcranial magnetic stimulator with a typical protocol that now we are using in the, in the clinical trials. So, other researchers uh, are trying to uh, see what is the mechanism of the action of the TDC, especially cathodal TDC in epilepsy. And this is a, a VC slide, but uh, in the bottom, you can see that in essentially uh, all the, the brain frequencies of these animal models uh, is increase the delta uh, power. So when the cathodal stimulation is applied, uh, especially under the electrodes on the brain, uh, it's possible to see this um, delta wave enhancement and decrease the high frequency, like beta and gamma power rate. So that is one of the mechanisms that we can uh, try to synchronize the brain and remember, if the brain can be synchronized in delta waves, like in sleep states, it's hard to spread abnormal epileptiform activity. Uh, it's very known that during the non-REM sleep, it's very hard to get a seizure because it's so synchronized in, the, in other states, this is not awake, uh, to get in a clinical seizure, for example. So 
Uh, I extrapolate from the literature, from other areas of the uh, research, what are the potential uh, mechanisms of the inhibition of the cortical excitability in patients with uh, epilepsy? So uh, I try to separate in acute effects or long-term effects because we have a, a variety of clinical situation in epilepsy, not only focal or generalized epilepsy. We have acute epilepsies or very long lasting uh, epilepsy. So in acute effects, you can see the list, the, this cathodal, even if the margin is anodal, is just invert, is reduced the intracortical and cortical spinal facilitation, induced postsynaptic hyperpolarization, uh, it's possible to get a reduction of presynaptic input, but mainly uh, they are a depression of synaptic force uh, by the NMDA receptors, locally changed in the pH or in the channels. And now you can see the, the channels you remember, oh, is it a, is it the same mechanism of the, any typical antecedent medication, maybe decreasing the uh, calcium, or modulation of the sodium or other acute uh, change in the anion. And the long-term effect, because it's important because uh, epilepsy is a chronic disease, uh, we can see this uh, potential mechanism, transmembrane protein migration, cell migration of neuron and glial cell and anti-inflammatory effects. Some of these uh, epilepsy have autoimmune uh, origins. So we can try to use in anti-inflammatory states uh, that can induce epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the any MDA receptor contribution to the, uh, to the effect of the cathodal uh, TDC, now you can see how big is the contribution of the any MDA receptors in the interictal epilepsy for anormalities in patients with epilepsy or not epilepsy, but patient uh, because you can uh, get in a patient with these abnormalities and the patient doesn't have a seizure but have been a high risk to develop clinical uh, seizures and then become a patient with epilepsy. So now it's clear to see if you can modulate with this therapy the anyway the receptors is possible to uh, try to decrease the numbers and the frequency of the interictal activities. Other uh, relevant aspect is uh, what's the effect of the other drugs? We don't have so much information about the, the 32 and decision medication in patients with epilepsy, but at least these two initial uh, trials show that it's not affected by the carbamazepine that is mediated by the sodium channel blocker uh, mechanism of the action and GABA uh, supported by the lorazepam in this case. So it's not any change if you is if using uh, cathodal or anodal. We are interested, of course, in cathodal effects, but we don't see at the moment any effect of these two drugs only. So what about uh, in humans using other methods to analyze the the change? Oh, this this is an initial study uh, that showed that uh, in patients with uh, drug resistant epilepsy, mainly temporal. Epilepsy is possible to see in this small group the reduction of the seizure, but the connectivity uh, is a decrease. But it's not clear what means decrease the connectivity in epilepsy. Even now, in using fMRI or magnetic encephalography, is still not so much to clear if it means good or not. But that is just the idea. Try to understand the mechanism in humans. So the first clinical trial conducted uh, in patients with refractory epilepsy was uh, uh, conducted by Dr. Felipe Fregni in Brazil uh, in, in 19, 19 patients with focal refractory epilepsy secondary to focal cortical dysplasia. He used the information from the animal models, 20 minutes, only one session, one million per and he didn't see any clinical change. But you can see in the graph how the change in the epileptic form and the charge activity decreased immediately after the stimulation and then recovery. 
after one month of follow. So that is the uh, effect in the clinical trials. The first clinical trial is possible to see a decrease or improvement in the biomarker of epilepsy, but no clinical effects. So, but it's only one session. So then after this publication, a uh, few case reports uh, were published, uh, one from Asia in one patient with focal cortical dysplasia, but the researcher applied five days, not only one session, five days, 20 minutes, the same protocol, but he start to see the decrease of the reduction of the seizure after more session. So this study was replicated in Boston, now in pediatric population, and he, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Aviyapa uh, get a very small decrease of the epilepsy 4 activity and the seizures at one month of follow. So that is the is starting the, of this application. And then in our institute, we apply the therapy in the one is one of the worst scenario. That's a patient with Rasmussen encephalitis. It's, Rasmussen encephalitis is an autoimmune severe uh, uh, epilepsy. So you can see from the MRI that is hemispheric um, lesions induced by the inflammation. And the usual treatment, if this is very common to fail to other medication, is hemispherectomy. But if the patient is an adult, we don't have uh, the plasticity. So become immediately after the surgery, hemiplegic or hemi, uh, hemi anesthesia or something related with the area that are uh, disconnected. So in the A, in the EEG, you don't see just general slowing because the epileptic for activity is so fast that even the standard EEG can capture in, in using clinical settings typical clinical settings filters. So when we use the electrocortical recording, like in the VEG recording, you can see the very high continuous epilepsy 4 activity that is not considered status epilepticus because the patient have 20, 10 twitch per minute. And then we apply the therapy in, in these two, two patients, uh, one, Adolescents and one uh, young uh, adult patient with Rasmussen encephalitis, but we apply one hour, four sessions, and we decrease the number of the seizures uh, after six months and one year of follow with improvement of the language. So this study published uh, in 2011 was replicated uh, five years later from uh, this. Uh, for Tector in Turkey, it's five patients receiving a classical TDC and modulate a TDC at 12 Hertz using similar protocol with similar results. And they also show that the effect lasts in one month. So uh, this is it's, it's interesting because this patient doesn't have so much uh, neuromodulation approach. So we summarize all the clinical data published at the moment uh, from uh, Frankly, that's the first study. Let me try to use the laser pointer. Yeah, okay. From Frankly and to Jiang. So we have to, to here. Uh, and in general, you can see the number of the patient is not so big, except the last one is uh, because in China, you know, everything in China is giant. And um, in the anal stimulation is uh, usually in a silent area or in contralateral supraorbital area. But the, the main issue is try to localize with no invasive or is even in invasive uh, techniques, the seizure onset or the epileptic focus. And then try to apply the number of the sessions. But now it's clear that you can uh, see that the study become positive if the number of the sessions is increasing 
starting for I1, and now it's standard to apply three or five, but the last study was applied two weeks, Monday to Friday, during two weeks, and with short follow-ups, six months maximum. And the conclusion of this uh, review is cathodal transcranial core stimulation is probably safe because that is the main concern. Remember, in a more neuromodulation work, one of the relative contraindication to apply any of these therapies, <laughs> the patient have seizures or history epilepsy. So we are uh, trying to fight fire with fire. So this is effective, decreasing the number of the epilepsy because the outcome is usually the seizure reduction, half or of course seizure, um, seizure free. But still the, the FDA approved device only gets 5% of seizure free reduction. So don't forget it. So it, even using the approved neuromodulation device in epilepsy, they don't become seizure free often. Oh, okay. So uh, in this graph, you can see one of, of uh, studies in patients with the temporal lobe epilepsy with uh, hippocampal sclerosis. So this is the typical uh, core of the patient, young patient using four or five antisocial medication with a long history of epilepsy, and we apply the therapy and follow for one or two months, and we see the difference uh, using three or five days uh, of the stimulation, one session per day, and the effect lasting at least two months, and then it's possible to reapply. So uh, now it's clear the reduction of the half of the epileptic seizure uh, after three, sorry, because in Spanish, it's three, three days or five days is uh, amazing. You know? uh, and the adverse events. So 90% of the patient have the inch sensation that is a minor auto limited side effect, uh, two patient headache, and very interesting, uh, two patients have um, this complex partial session during the therapy. We stop the therapy and during this clinical trial and then start again and the next day uh, with any problems. So uh, in at this stage, we stop the therapy because we don't know the acute effect during the seizures. Uh, other uh, researchers replicate the study uh, in um, temporal of epilepsy as well. Uh, is uh, you in the graph you can see very easy before and after the therapy uh, in 12 patients with similar protocol and using the same outcomes the seizure reduction half or 50 percent threshold of reduction of the seizures and minor side effects so what about in other etiologies uh, not only in pocket sclerosis now from the University of Melbourne in, with 29 patients using this uh, uh, protocol to enhance the effect of the TDC, nine, 20 minutes break, nine minutes stimulation with the same uh, design, uh, it's possible to get an reduction of 41% of the seizure. Remember, when the patient become refractory to any seizure medication, the effect of the new drug can be reached in only 15 by 1%. So it's three times more than the, any uh, anti seizure medication available in the market, in refractory epilepsy. So uh, it's safe because it just induces the uh, slightly tingle sensation. And uh, it's possible in humans, like in rats, to shake the to evaluate the cortical excitability using TMS, and it's the, the same result that the animals, that decrease the cortical excitability in this core, the patient. So what about if you have the resource to monitoring during uh, 24 hours, the EEG after the, the typical session? Well, now we can see in this uh, uh, study from Kaufman in, 50 adults with drug resistant focal epilepsy applying the protocol two minutes of stimulation, nine minutes of break, and using two milliampers, that this the epileptic for activity decrease uh, after hours, not after uh, one and a half hours. 
the maximum interictal epilepsy for reduction was observed between the three and 21 hours of stimulation. So now you have more data to try to apply the second session during the day or the next day, or how long is the fact, and not only in the acute uh, settings in your lab. Uh, of course, is the replication of the acute effect in the interictal epilepsy activity was observed in 68%. So at the beginning, not all the studies were positive, remember? So I like to present you this slide because this is one of the initial studies in patients with frontal lobe epilepsy. So uh, they apply in 10 patients, exploratory, 2 million pairs, 20 minutes by uh, two weeks, and they don't find any results in EEG, clinical diaries, etc. Uh, with one month of follow. Now we are moving more, but just to show that they no all are positive because they are different variables that can influence the outcome. So other catastrophic scenario is the patient with lenox gastro syndrome that include the very severe uh, tonic, atonic, uh, or tonic-clonic seizure with the atypical absence in pediatric population. So this study was published in 2016. And you can see from the table, the baseline seizure frequency per day is mainly 100 no? seizure per day. And the number of the epileptiform discharge is just in 30 minutes is, is huge amount the other epileptiform burden. So one of the spectacular findings that is applying this therapy in this uh, uh, encephalopathic epileptic uh, is is possible to reduce the seizure, but what's so miraculous that the at the four or five days of stimulation, ninety nine percent of the patient have reduction of the frequency. That is not common to see in the clinic, even if the patient uh, were video recorded. So we replicate the study in our uh, center to try to see, oh, that is really a good option. We we can to use it uh, in the clinical practice. Well, we apply a similar protocol in our population. You can see the age main is um, in, not, in 10 years old uh, with several etiologies, mainly perinatal hypoxia. And in the graph, you can see the effect comparing with the baseline the main effect is, is true, is during the first and two weeks, and then rapidly recovery because it's, it's easy to understand that you can stop 100 seizures just when one session so, or 10 sessions. So, but this still is an opportunity to research. Mm -hmm. So moving uh, to other population, patients with West syndrome or epileptic spasm, uh, the results are mixed, but we have the opportunity to see the youngest patient possible to apply with epilepsy, two years. You know? Some are positive, some are negative, it's not conclusive, uh, using uh, similar protocols, one or two million pairs for 40 minutes per day, we a follow of one month, etc. So we, in our, some, in our center, we apply sometimes uh, consecutive uh, patients that uh, coming from our own clinical trials, we still to apply in patients with response with any change in the medication <clears throat> and the effect persists if you apply monthly, for example, in this case report. So with collaboration with Boston Children's Hospital, now in pediatric population with refractory epilepsy, using more sophisticated software and device, we modeling the epileptic form source, and then the current, the mapping, combined with the MRI information, clinical data, etc., to try to personalize a multi-channel uh, uh, stimulation approach to try to localize the maximal effect in cathodal stimulation in patients with epilepsy, especially if the patient has multifocal or some areas that are more affected than the others usually are no candidate to epilepsy surgery. And we get this, uh, I, I like to, to show this graph because 
is very similar to the standard FDA approved uh, device. Initially, a small increase, and then with the time, you can see the 44% of relative uh, reduction of the seizure comparing with the baseline. And the effect lasting is the same, uh, depend on the follow, -up, but usually it's needed to apply again. Using this standard protocol, two million pairs, 20 minutes, 10 days. So in France, uh, other group replicate in upper single arm uh, in this patient with focal drug resistant epilepsy, now using a stereo EG. The stereo EG is an invasive EEG during the presurgical evaluation, but get this data to try to modeling the, the multifocal approach uh, using a similar device to try to localize uh, the focus onset. Remember, Epilepsy sometimes is not so focal. It's, an, it's a network disease. So, but they get the standard results. One sequence stimulation, 30% uh, of reduction, 57% or maximum three cycles. That means that it's dose dependent. And in, in, in the, we also, uh, the number of the cycle is relevant to effect. We don't know now uh, what is the best protocol. But now we can start to learn for the patients. So give the opportunity to evaluate the, in humans, the brain frequencies. And remember in the animal models? Okay, so when they try to separate patients with no responder versus responder, they also see the difference in the uh, high frequencies, alpha and beta comparing with the no responders. So decreasing similar to the animal models. That, so that is good because that are similar. So now they are exploratory. Uh, what about more about uh, the quality of life? So uh, in this uh, randomized placebo controlled clinical trial uh, using high definition TDC uh, with two milliampers, 30 minutes, two weeks, comparing with placebo, they get the similar uh, clinical effect. But applying this graph in small population, you can see a lot of the variables are significant. That means that, remember, in epilepsy, we are moving the area that we are stimulating. But what happens if you apply the same area that is using for depression? For example, left frontal lobe. So maybe you can improve not only seizures, you can improve sleep, you can improve the fatigue, pain, et cetera, or memories if it's in the temporal lobe, et cetera. So uh, that is just exploratory, but to show, okay, that we can to add this kind of, of the surveys or scales or scores to try to see more beyond the seizures. So uh, now moving to the acute effect, so remember, at the beginning of clinical trial, we stop the therapy if the patient has seizures. Now, we decide after this many patients involved in our clinical trials to apply the therapy during the seizures. So we decide, okay, we don't stop the, the therapy. If the patient has a seizure, maintain the seizure and the device at the same time. So we get patients with lenox gastaut syndrome because you know 100 seizures per day is possible to see during the clinic in one seizure. Or patients with multifocal epilepsy or are pediatric using uh, many medications with the history of the perinatal hypoxia. This is the montage. But the more relevant result is the duration. Uh, we compare or previous data from the video you recorded, the duration of the typical standard tonic seizure versus during the acute TDC uh, treatment. You can see the reduction is the half, the change, at least uh, 58%, similar to the animal models, but it's now we are talking in humans. So uh, you can see, uh, this is our previous video EG, the duration, the tonic seizure. You know, this is the, we measure uh, the typical seizure duration. And then during the TDC, we don't stop the therapy. We also can measure the, the brain waves frequency, but the effect was shorter. 
with any side effects in the patient. So I, now I can show you uh, the seizure started here during the therapy, the patient is receiving now. You can see the high frequency of the typical uh, ictal pattern in tonic seizure, and then just very briefly start to, to interrupt, so aborted, and become slow, very slow. That is the post state of any seizure, in this case, from tonic seizures during the acute therapy. So with this data not published at the moment, was published simultaneously from the Canada group uh, in patients uh, with a refractory status epilepticus. Uh, they try to apply the therapy in the patient with refractory status epilepticus with different etiologies, many vascular, uh, applying the therapy 20 minutes, two milliampers over the maximum activity. And they also decrease the median spike rate for patients that are half to 50%, uh, comparing uh, uh, with the historical control, they uh, report that the possibility to become uh, discharged from the neuro ICU is 45% higher comparing with the control, but still the mortality is so high. So it's not possible to follow the patient diet for other reasons. But uh, it's interesting because they end up trying to apply the therapy in the worst scenario, that is refractory status epilepticus. Uh, but uh, the acute effect, you see, before the seizure, be, sorry, before the, the therapy, and then uh, during the transcranial direct current simulation, and then post. Now, when you see in the session two during the transcranial direct current simulation, it's similar to the animal models results, become uh, a decrease of the interictal epileptic form of the charts and become more synchronized, more data activity is seen and decrease the number of the beta activity. But remember, when patient with the refractory such epilepticus is under a lot of decision medication, including anesthesia. So, so we don't know what is the interaction with the medication and decision medication or anesthetics drugs. Uh, but uh, we try to apply this therapy, now trying to move forward because we see, okay, if we apply the TDC in acute uh, in clinic settings using uh, the standard transcranial direct current stimulation, and uh, the Mozart effect with my phone uh, outside of the patient, two neuromodulation techniques that can modulate non-invasively the therapy. What is the effect on the brain in, in this patient? Unfortunately, uh, this lady have months, months, three months of refractory uh, uh, autoimmune, any MDR receptor encephalitis, in a status epilepticus with no any benefit with the standard treatment or beyond using cannabis, etc. Uh, and then we try to apply this therapy after the ethic committee approval uh, in our hospital. And you can see the focal activity on the, on the frontal regions continuously. And then after the therapy, simultaneous therapy using the Mozart effect, this is a very specific uh, sonata with the TDC at the same time, how is this chain, the EEG, it's called EEG after the therapy. Uh, this is no simultaneous EEG recording, it's after the intervention. And then the patient, uh, of course, stops seizing, but it then become encephalopathic, no response, remember, three months after the onset of the status epilepticus, and then, uh, unfortunately, uh, the status epilepticus back the next day. We applied three times to try to improve. I will to show the video of the patient with the focal right movements. Uh, and after applied the, the therapy, uh, unfortunately, the patient have an, a severe pneumonia because you see the a lot of saliva that can provoke this complication and the patient died for sepsis, shock septic. This is a chronic patient 
we know or we remember in the clinic patient with super refractory stasis epilepticus uh, in our uh, hospital lasting months or so. so now, what about the safety of the TDC in epilepsy? Well, uh, from this core of the those dose or chain density in colons by metro square, uh, you can see we are so far from the lesion threshold. But of course, we know that there are a potential a neuronal damage by electricity in patients with the other condition in other situations. But this uh, amount of intensity is so far that we are not any concern. Now we are using during the acute effect to get the birth result. So in summary, cathode transcendent core stimulation is probably safe because it's no increased seizures. But remember, if you apply only cathode, if you apply in the correct side, and it's effective decreasing the seizure, at least 50% of the reduction during the standard follow-up two months in focal refractory epilepsy. So we are trying to explore in other generalized refractory epilepsy that also is a problem, but we don't have good experience in, and we don't have so much data. And we are focused now in the, this focal refractory epilepsy because it's, uh, the major group that is affected. Okay, so with this slide, I can uh, see, thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk to you about this um, potential and promising uh, intervention in patients with focal epilepsy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the excellent presentation. Okay, so let's start with uh, some uh, questions. Uh, Daniel, I would, I would like, because you, you are presenting a lot of uh, evidence and a lot of examples of application of TDCS with in different types of epilepsy. And we have seen Erasmus encephalitis, we have seen Mesial epilepsy with, with uh, hypocampal sclerosis, we have seen Lennox Gastaut, we have seen status epilepsy, with West syndrome, and finally focal epilepsy. So. Based on your experience, what type of epilepsy um, epilepsies are more likely to respond actually positively to, t to TDCS? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question because we have a lot of the priority, even if the focal can be focal temporal, frontal, parietal, occipital. So, because it's more frequent to get uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, we have more experience in temporal lobe epilepsy. But, uh, we get best result in temporal comparing with the frontal, frontal lobe epilepsy. But it's common to see this kind of the behavior, even using other intervention. Is if it responds, responds well in temporal lobe epilepsy. Mm -hmm. It's not response well in other very severe epilepsy syndrome, like a Linus Gastaut or West syndrome that sometimes can can see any effects. Because you know, we publish the, usually the positive results, but also we are interested to see that some patients with frontal lobe epilepsy, we don't have, we don't have any benefit. The main concern for us is, okay, if you apply uh, with the, your clinical hypothesis that see, oh, it's temporal, but the patient doesn't have just temporal epilepsy, maybe have frontal temporal or it's bilateral and you are in the wrong side, Maybe it's one explanation that you can apply. So maybe you can give the opportunity to the patient to try in your first hypothesis, and then if they fail after uh, uh, the follow-up, you can try another location, if it's possible, of course. If this is the same area, it's lesional, maybe it's not a good idea. And, and with regards to actually following up to this question regarding the predicting responsiveness, so actually some some biomarkers some indicators some techniques neuroimaging or neurophysiological techniques that could somehow help predict which patients with epilepsy are more likely to respond to the to the tdcs treatment yeah i i can start a little bit back because in the fda approved device we don't have any biomarkers <laughs> so so that we are with this huge problem because when the patient receives the back and nerve stimulation or deep brain stimulation, we don't know if the patient will be response. After, just after the surgery and apply the therapy, 
So this is a this is good it's good news for the, the for us and the researchers, but bad news for the patient because we don't have predictor. So maybe using the EG is a good idea if the epileptic form burden is a lot. It's possible to get oh maybe it's possible to try to reduce, but we don't have clear uh, predicted biomarkers. Maybe the cortical excitability is one of them using TMS is potentially is possible if this. So big the, the excitability, and you can see, oh, because we are trying in another opposite way. We use the TDC to evaluate if the patient will be respond to the FDA approved device. Because if the patient responds to weak uh, treatment, no, or yeah, or consecutive treatment, it's possible to see the patient, okay, you can go to direct to the surgery because you are sensitive to electricity in general. No. Of course, the mechanism of the action is completely different. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And and uh, you were mentioning um, the interaction of, of pharmacotherapy, especially that uh, they were studied with carbamazepine and levetiracetam with interaction with TDCS. I was thinking about like exploring completely another approach is uh, enhance the seizure control with uh, and, and the overall outcome combining actually the, looking for the synergies between TDCS and uh, pharmacotherapy and then reducing the drug doses and uh, potential drug uh, side effects, but introducing additional technique for, for uh, within the pharmacotherapy. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, from the previous study, we have the hypothesis that combine the TDCS, I'm sorry, the TDC therapy with GABAergic drugs can potentially improve the efficacy. Or uh, with, because the, the time of the follow is short, we can change so much the medication uh, to decrease the number of the anti medication. We need uh, at least one year of follow to try to move uh, medication. But it's a good idea. Or with the other no standard anti medication, like you see, Okay, what happened if we started the TDC, like in the case with the refractory epilepsy, we imagine, okay, why not two? Two neuromodulation technique. Or now we are thinking, oh, what if you started the ketogenic diet at the same time? Or because we are changing the environment, the brain, or using uh, cannabis or other drugs. Maybe, maybe it's just uh, ideas to the audience to run the clinical trials <laughs> in the future, but we don't have the information, just a hypothesis, a, a typical hypothesis of the labs. Actually, there are questions in the in the in the, yeah. in, the in the chat uh, regarding the combination of CBD or medical cannabis with uh, with TDCS and and interaction. Actually, there is a specific question regarding the Dravet syndrome. If you have any experience with the Dravet syndrome uh, and TDCS, because. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. like, uh, you know, with Lennox, uh, Rasmussen, and uh, the specific version in Dravet. Yeah, uh, in Dravet syndrome, it, it's not conclusive. Uh, I show uh, one slide in patients with the spasm epilepticus, um, and some of them have a response, and half of them don't have a response. It's possible to try, because after the fail of the, the, the therapy, you can try uh, to apply it safely, because are uh, usually babies or infants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There is I, a I question. Have, yeah. I don't have personal experience, but from the literature, it's possible. Yeah. There's a question from John regarding the non-focal uh, um, montages and, and I guess non-focal epilepsies. And and actually, I would like to extend this uh, to uh, we have seen the the positive results regarding uh, reduction of seizure rate and uh, and epilepsy from this surgery. The surgeons, what about, and this was during the interictal period, what about the ictal period actually, if we apply the stimulation during the ictal period uh, to stop the ongoing seizure? So you are, you are, you are showing this example with the, uh, with, with some, some atoms, uh, but what, what, what your, your take on the stopping the seizure actually with the stimulation? Yeah, if you are, uh, it's, it's hard. To synchronize the patient is ceasing, and you apply the therapy. So the 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 more adequate clinical scenario is in the lab with the animal rats induced. Even for for video recording, it's not so easy to capture the vents and then 
apply at the same time. But in humans, uh, during the status epilepticus, it's possible to see the effect, especially if we have the EEG monitoring. And we try uh, this uh, protocol in our, our patient uh, two months ago. And we see the acute uh, decrease of the interrupted epileptic for activity, even this the, the number of the electrographic seizures decrease, but we need time to awake the patient because it's not miraculous it's awaken from the new ICU. But it is it's possible to see this kind of the acute effect. Now it's just case report, but I think in the future, uh, if it's included in patient with refractory clinical trials, uh, trials is possible to analyze the effect. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question from Stephen regarding uh, new techniques like uh, interference stimulation or, or focused ultrasound. What is your take on this regarding the, the promise of focality and uh, deeper stimulation uh, in, in, in epilepsy? Yeah, uh, there are others, no invasive uh, techniques. Uh, ultrasound is, is good, it's one of the new uh, promising therapies. It's still just starting very, very early effect to see is possible to modulate it, but we have also experience with this like you with your iPhone with the bagel no invasive stimulation in in, in the ear that is more uh, it's more attractive because you don't need the lab and with this uh, huge uh, ultrasound device uh, that is it's difficult to apply the ultrasound, the school structure. This is a huge problem, but it's promising. I, I can uh, see so much now with this short time, but it's, it's promising at this moment, both therapy. Okay, thank you. And there is a question regarding like a general uh, long-term effects since uh, epilepsy is a chronic disease. So um, there was interest uh, regarding understanding the long-term effects. Uh, uh, what do we know actually about the, the, the long-term effects of TDCS in, in epilepsy? And what we are talking yeah. about long-term effects in this case? Yeah, we published this uh, patient with the long, uh, is, is one of the longest patients that has published because it's one year, but was interrupted by the COVID pandemic. The follow-up is, is, is very difficult to follow the patient during the pandemic. But uh, the idea is uh, with the evidence completion, at least six months or one year, the effect can be uh, maintained for a repetitive session. Now, what it means for the brain repetitive transcranial accurate stimulation is under research, especially if the patient is pediatric patient or the plasticity, for example. But we know if we, if we can stop the seizure for any intervention, we give the opportunity to the brain to develop and become better in general. So maybe it's in the balance that we have uh, opportunity to try our patient in open label monthly with, with the same maintained results that we see in the clinical trial. Okay, okay, actually, so this is... This is with line uh, with the with the data you're presenting regarding the quality of life changes. So it's not only the the number of seizures uh, or interictal events, but also the quality of life and MOCA or cognitive functions actually improving cognitive functions with the stimulation, not directly related to the to the reducing number of of seizures. Exactly. Uh, we have. Uh, the question from Anna, what do you think about the application of digital twins to study the TTCS effect in epilepsy? I mean, it's uh, regarding the general modeling or, or working with the models when the in silico models uh, uh, before applying this to in vivo patients. Oh, I think uh, each effort to try to localize better the the focus of epilepsy and the model of the electrical become better for some patients, not all the patients. Because remember, if the disease is so, this is in a very large area that is involved, like for example, for perinatal epoxia, that's a huge area, maybe it's not needed. No? But if it's a focal, uh, you can try to see, okay, this is a surgical candidate because it's a focal, you go directly to the surgery, not go to the neuromodulation, exactly. Or 
if you have multifocal, that's the the maybe the good scenario. Okay, you can try to modeling one and then the other part to separate. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, we try to use it in the French group also, uh, in in our labs, and it's it's good idea to start to proving. Yeah. Okay. The the question from San is regarding. Uh... Uh, how deep could TDCS reach and how to prove that uh, it indeed applied the stimulation? So combining SEG and TDCS, could we see the artifact used by TDCS activity like in EEG? We know that, uh, uh, that there are papers actually showing uh, that based on the TDCF uh, propagation, we can see activity in, in, in hippocampus, in amygdala. Uh, but um, yeah, what 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 is what is your opinion regarding this the the the, the, the stimulation the deep regions uh, uh, in epilepsy? Yeah, uh, even uh, hippocampus is a deep structure. is is now in the cortical area. So uh, yes, we are agree that it's possible to see the 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 effect in a very deep structure, but not because it's the intensity. It's because just the neural network. So that is the, the, the mechanism of the action. Is maybe reach the cortex and the modulation of the cortex because it's not a no induced potential actions on the neurons. This is, is change the membrane excitability and then can induce modification in the, in the network. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Really uh, very interesting. We are running out of time. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks for all questions. Uh, uh, thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I hope you will uh, join us again for the for the next webinar. And our next webinar, um, we will have as a guest Professor Fernando Maes too, and we'll be talking about the brain oscillation activity associated with space flights. So we are we are moving. Uh, to space, uh, still with EEG, still with EEG, maybe a little bit with stimulation, and still with the with the brain. So from directly clinical application to some more research application. Thank you, thank you, Daniel, very much. Uh, thank you for all your uh, for your presentation and for answering all your all questions. If there are any additional questions, uh, we will try to forward these questions directly to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so please uh, visit our webpage, uh, neurolexic.com, for more information about upcoming webinars where you can register to the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao.